This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. In this week's episode, some deep dives into an assortment of topics. What goes on at Christian Fashion Week? Reporter Jessica Meisner of BuzzFeed decided to find out and shares her take, including Israel-inspired purses and Bible-quoting t-shirts. And the world of money and investing has changed quite a lot, but for longtime Wall Street veteran Simon Lack, it's changing in specific ways that few notice. Lack first came to my attention with his 2011 book, The Hedge Fund Mirage, in which he revealed that the hedge fund industry, rather than being a boon for investors, has actually lost money for its clients overall. His new book, Bonds Are Not Forever, challenges more conventional thinking. But first, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel is known to so many of us in a variety of ways. For many, he's that rabbi who marched with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, where he declared, my feet were praying. But for many others, he's someone who transformed the core of Jewish thought. The first book to tackle his entire set of philosophical works and examine them critically is Shai Held's Abraham Joshua Heschel, The Call of Transcendence. Here's my interview with Shai Held. With this book, uh, with a project like this focusing on Heschel, Heschel is in many ways one of the more popular rabbis, one of the more popular philosophers of the 20th century Judaism. And, and he's got a legacy that endures in a, in a particular way in the Jewish community. And I'm wondering, in working on this book, you must have had a great many conversations with a great many people about Heschel. And, and what is your sense of what makes him popular in the Jewish community? And I think what makes Heschel such an interesting figure is that for him it really is about the marriage of worshiping God, Avodat Hashem, and the quest for social justice. It's about worshiping a God who tells you what about the widows and the orphans? What about the widows and the orphans? A lot of social justice talk in the Jewish community, certainly not all, but a lot of it is fairly secular or secularized. That is not Heschel's voice at all. So his idea uh, essentially is that uh, um, not just charity, but but a sense of uh, but a sense of caring for others, a sense of involvement with others, uh, is 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 part of the everyday. And and one of the interesting things he does with that is he says that all the mitzvot, all the commandments, all the different ritual aspects of Judaism, are ways of exposing oneself or or of inviting in uh, God's presence. And that if and since God is so abundantly uh, concern for others, that one, that one gets a, develops a greater concern for others through these activities. Right. So the ideal, the ideal picture, when religion works, which is always a big caveat in conversations about religion, when religion works, a way of saying this perhaps is the line between worshiping God and caring more deeply for others is almost totally obliterated, right? Because the more I serve God, the more I realize that that God keeps telling me, right, go back and love more, go back and love more deeply. You want to love me, love whom I love. That's the constant preoccupation. It's also maybe important to say it's a profoundly this-worldly understanding of religion, right? That is to say, a God who tells you, you want to serve me, don't leave the world behind. Don't go into the Beit Midrash, the Jewish study hall, and forget the world entirely. That study hall is supposed to tell you how to function more deeply and more presently in this world. And one of the things that, that makes Heschel uh, so beloved is, is not just his ideas, but the way he presented them. One of the main things he's trying to do as a writer is evoke rather than just convince, right? And that's actually about heart opening and not just mind expanding. And that's very, very fundamental to what he's doing as a writer. However, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that I think that he has been in some ways a victim of his own eloquence. That is, very often in the American Jewish community, he is treated as effectively a Jewish Bartlett's right, a font of aphorisms that people go to for great quotes. And there's some legitimacy to that. He wrote like that, right? So on some level, he, as it were, asked for it. But I think what's often lost is there is a really coherent, powerful interpretation of the whole Jewish tradition and of what it means to be a religious person. And I felt that that was very rarely drawn out for well, people. I think he felt that the Jewish community was in the process of being divided between on the one hand, people who were coming close to reducing Judaism to law, halacha is everything, what he called pan-halachism or religious behaviorism, and he felt the need to insist, wait a second, the God of Torah, the God of Tanakh, is a God of love, is a God of universal concern, is a God who cares profoundly about justice. Being concerned only with law is a distortion of the Jewish tradition. And on the other hand, he was worried that a Judaism that was only about ideas and was not 
committed in some sense to rigorous practice, to some notion of law, that kind of Judaism ran the risk of becoming a series of abstract platitudes. So there's a kind of push against both directions as he saw them happening in the Jewish community. One is a dilution of commitment to law and practice, and the other is an over-obsession with focus on law and, and practice. And now, Christian Fashion Week, as seen through the eyes of BuzzFeed reporter Jessica Meisner. I'm here with BuzzFeed writer Jessica Meisner, who recently visited a Christian fashion show. So what was that like? It was interesting. Um, I didn't know quite what to expect. My previous job was a fashion editor at the Huffington Post, so I spent a lot of time in this New York Fashion Week world, very glamorous, you know, models and all that kind of thing. Um, but I wanted to see what other alternative fashion weeks there were. And so what makes a fashion show a Christian fashion show and a fashion week a Christian fashion week? That was one thing I was really intrigued to find out. Um, you know, what makes a blouse or a dress Christian? Um, obviously the, the key thing everyone thinks of is modesty, right? So you're not going to have cleavage, you're not going to, you know, you assume there's going to be a lot of turtlenecks and things like that. Um, but there wasn't, in my mind, a lot to differentiate it from, say, a fashion week. The, the type of clothes you might see at a fashion week in New York. There were a few strapless things, you know, a few tank tops. Some dresses weren't, you know, maybe like a little bit above the knee, um, but nothing quite Amish or, yeah. And even beyond the runway, there's some just some basic differences with the culture that you found. The thing that struck me, which is a good thing, is that everybody was very warm and friendly. Uh, you know, in my experience, there were a lot, of, when you go to fashion parties, things like that, a lot of people aren't. It'll give you the once over, kind of judge your outfit. Um, people kind of stick to themselves. So everybody was very warm and welcoming, which I found refreshing. And one thing you even found, you found some Israel, Israel stuff at the, uh, at the fashion show. There was one, um, so there were vendors, kind of like you would have at any fashion show, kind of selling jewelry and trinkets and purses in one case. Um, th yeah, this one group I was talking to um, had a pro US, pro Israel, sign and they had their purses had these doves on them and it was kind of an interesting story. The um, It's a military family and they kind of got into this secondhand business selling these purses for you know what they thought was a good cause. But I, I found that for most people and the designers I talked to, I think the focus was on not so much the product being Christian and religious but in that God kind of informed their calling into fashion and inter intersected every part of their lives. And finally, Simon Lack discussing why bonds are not forever. A lot of what you're saying speaks to the kind of the core political issues that divide America right now, and what and the discussion of what is America's future is really tied to these basic economic questions. And in particular, it's interesting that in relation to the idea of low interest rates, we have basically uh, one wing of American politics that is adamantly against it, and that's kind of the, the Ron Paul, Rand Paul uh, Tea Party wing of the Republican Party, party that's adamantly against low interest rates, against the Fed's intervention in the economy. But, uh, but by and large, the rest of American politics, the rest of American society isn't engaged in that discussion and, and isn't necessarily advocating very much for the low interest rate policy, but it is what we're getting as a de facto policy. It is, and in fact, it helps us because we have enormous amounts of debt. And that's why there's so little real political support for tough budget decisions, because you get the immediate pain of higher taxes or reduced spending, but the benefit is over the long run. So there's no sort of political upside. It may be that it would be good public policy, but it's really not going to gather much political support. And so I don't really see anything dramatic on that side. Right, and, and underlying all of this is what you were saying about this, this almost this generational warfare. There's, there is an economic war between the older generations and the younger generations in America today. No one, very few are realizing it, no one's declaring it, but it exists in the sense that, uh, that if we don't adjust the healthcare spending curve around particularly end of life spending, mm -hmm. uh, medical spending around Medicare, uh, that money will far exceed, the money spent will far exceed what boomers put into the system. Uh, and, uh, and, and younger families will ultimately be, be left with the bill. That's right. And so the, the sort of least painful way to resolve that is for the government to borrow money you know, at a negative real cost because it's paid for by the savers. It's paid for by the Chinese and by the Japanese as well, because they, you know, each central bank owns a trillion dollars of bonds, right? 
and so um, you know that's and of course they don't get to vote explicitly right so so to me that's the that's the path of least resistance that's the way we're going today and there isn't a whole lot of political opposition to that I think you should expect that to continue so right. I think bond returns are going to be disappointing for a long time and interwoven throughout the whole book is is a lot of personal narrative uh, about your your history uh, in London on Wall Street and uh, and it seems that at various points uh, you're expressing some shock at, at, at the kinds of financial developments that we've seen over the past 30 years in terms of the development of what I believe the, the common term was exotic financial products when we were talking about regulation uh, in recent years uh, that that are significantly divorced in, in from their sale between their sale price and and the underlying value and, and the ability to get almost anybody off the street to buy things they should not be buying well there's a there's a huge challenge here for finance you know the financial service industry basically doubled in size from 1980 until 2008 what's happened I think in many cases is that the, the Wall Street to use that term um, has lost sight of its role in which is really to channel savings from savers to productive forms of capital formation. That is the fundamental purpose. And there's so much activity that takes place that is really sort of divorced from that. And I almost feel like, um, oh, and I mean, I see it all the time in terms of poor advice given to individual investors and products designed that really have very little possibility of generating a fair return. And it's almost as if in finance, there should be the equivalent of sort of a Hippocratic oath that you know, anybody who's structuring a transaction, who's offering financial advice, should stop and say, fundamentally, is this, is this good for my client? Not is it what the client thinks they want, but is it fundamentally going to achieve what the client's aims clearly have to be over the long run? And I think that finance would, uh, would be doing a far better job for society if bankers stopped and just asked that basic question first. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under premium channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.